Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 93, Comedy, History and Morality, Three Early Tudor Plays. Last time, I completed my review of legislation relating to the Tudor theatre, and I hope that this, along with the previous episodes about the performing spaces and the stage players, sets us up for a look at the plays and playwrights of the period. It's certainly not the last time that I'll be looking at the playhouses and the performers. We can get more specific and detailed about both of these a little further down the line. But for now, I'm going to look at what were some of the earliest performed plays in the period. It's a small selection, but there is little that has survived, and it is from these that we have to try to discern the progress of theatre in the Tudor period. And I think this is a good point where I should make a little summary of where we are. How did Tudor theatre, and particularly its pinnacle, the Elizabethan theatre, get to where it did is a really complex question, with many factors playing into the social, religious and political situation to one degree or another. Quite how these factors interacted exactly to create the theatre of the day is still hotly debated, so I'll mention them here, but with no particular reference to their relative importance or impact. But they are all, in one way or another, in my view, significant. England's geographical position on the northern edge of Europe certainly played its part. It meant that the delayed influence of the Renaissance arrived in a well-formed way. Some understanding of the literature, the art and the philosophy of the ancients had already been processed and understood by the continental scholars, and advances in printing allowed the influence of the Renaissance to spread more quickly in England than it did in other parts of the European continent. Renaissance thinking, and particularly humanist influence, developed in tandem with the religious reformation, which was more far-reaching and spread more quickly than in continental Europe. Because of royal support for and manipulation of the Reformation, there was arguably more freedom of thought in England than in continental Europe, with the possible exception of the northern Low Countries. Not that freedom of thought meant freedom of expression, as we've heard in the last two episodes. England was an outward-looking country at the time, growing in confidence, looking to get their share of the New World discoveries, a frame of mind that fired the imagination of playwrights. Tales of the exotic came back regularly to London through merchants, diplomats and other travellers, making London one of the most cosmopolitan cities of the time. The capital had large immigrant communities who added to this outward perspective even when they were the cause of unrest in the city, or at least were blamed for it. In theatre specifically, the influence of Seneca is undeniable. He, along with Terence and Plautus, was favoured by the gentry who owned the acting troops and the university and law students who were the other driving force in early Tudor theatre. Seneca's bloody tragedies were popular because of the extreme actions reported on stage, but also because they used language to paint those pictures, something that English, with its vocabulary enriched by French and Latin, was just becoming able to emulate and even surpass. And we should not overlook the fact that theatre in its medieval form was a very popular form of public entertainment amongst the general population. However, controlled by the church as it was, it was filled with spectacle and farce as much as with religious doctrine. This popularity certainly helped with the popularity and advancement of secular theatre once that arrived. Henry VIII had little interest in the theatre, being more focused on art and music and it was his nobles who created the phenomena of the playing troupe. So unlike in continental Europe, theatre was not primarily a court extravagance, but something that people had the opportunity to enjoy at first hand on a regular basis. When theatre in London was brought into permanent homes, there was a ready and familiar audience waiting for them. Both touring theatres and the London-based players were one of the popular entertainments of the day. And for all of those points... I have to acknowledge that the development of theatre in England to its greatest heights could also have been down, basically, to the lucky appearance of several great playwrights at about the same time. Playwrights who excelled and pulled all the others up to great heights. So if we put Marlowe, Johnson and Webster in the top tier with Shakespeare, and I'm sure we could have a lengthy discussion about that, but bear with me, 
Many of those left in the second tier were by no means also rands and produced good, even great work. I put this theory out there. I don't particularly subscribe to it because I think that more often than not, genius doesn't really come from nowhere, but from the ground in which it was sown. But this is all maybe getting ahead of ourselves. For the moment, we need to go back to the students at university and at the Inns of Court to find the very earliest Tudor theatre that has come down to us. With Greek and Latin being taught in these establishments and in the growing number of schools for younger boys, Terence, Plautus and Seneca became familiar to more people, primarily as a teaching tool. Students eventually began to perform the plays or stage readings for their fellow students and masters. In fact, records show that King's College at Cambridge University were putting on such performances as early as 1482 and that Oxford University colleges were not far behind them. So there was already quite a history of performance of some sort at the universities. It's difficult to imagine that the students didn't enjoy the acting and production element of plays, but this was essentially an academic exercise. At Oxford, a degree was awarded on the basis of a common play in a classical style, written and produced by a student. Both universities have records showing expenses for productions of Greek and Latin plays. At the Inns of Court, acting in classical plays was part of the curriculum. The exact purpose of this is unclear, but presumably it was thought to help young men hoping to become lawyers and court officials by giving them good training in how to express and present themselves and their ideas to a public audience. Eton College, located close to the Royal Castle at Windsor, has records of visits to performances by the students seen by Henry and Elizabeth, and although Elizabeth came late to the attractions of the playhouse, there were, eventually, many plays and interludes performed in her various homes for her amusement. But it was the world of academia and education that gave us the first plays in English that have survived. Schoolmasters and students were the first playwrights in English. I feel sure that there were others whose work has not survived, but the man with the best claim to being the first playwright in English is Nicholas Udall. Born in 1504, he attended Westminster School and then Oxford University, where he obtained a bachelor's degree and then some years later, a master's degree. He was influenced by Erasmus and Luther, whose ideas were much discussed at Oxford at the time. He became a teacher, but continued to read and discuss dangerous religious and philosophical papers. At one point, he was arrested for possessing copies of Luther and Tyndale's translation of the New Testament. He escaped only by publicly recanting. He then managed to stay on the right side of the law as he rose to be headmaster at Eton College. But he left under a cloud, something that involved the theft of the college silver. He was imprisoned for a short time, but was then released and his back wages were paid in full. The implication is that he must have had some good connections. And in fact, he was soon working on translations of various works commissioned by the Princess Mary. When she took the throne as Queen, he was appointed Director of Court Revels for a short time before taking up the position of Headmaster at Westminster School. So, at some time between 1534 and 1554, he wrote a farcical comedy, Ralph Royster-Doyster. Most thinking seems to lean towards the later date, thanks to some small clues in the text, but as the only extant copy has no authorial details in it, much of this is guesswork. It's assumed that the play was first performed during this period, probably by the boys at Westminster School, but all we can say for certain is that it was printed in 1566. The fact of it getting into print alone tells us that it was a popular success. There's no evidence for performance of the play, but it has been claimed that the first unabridged professional performance didn't occur until 2015. But the printing and survival of the text goes a long way to suggesting that there were many earlier performances in the years after it was written. The eponymous Ralph is a version of the Braggart soldier character from Terence and Plautus, and although the play is heavily influenced by these two ancients, it isn't a straight adaptation or homage. The elements of farce are reminiscent of the comedy in medieval cycle plays, and elements of temptation in the play owe something to morality plays. With this combination of classical and English traditions, a focus on the middle classes as leading characters, and some elements of chivalric theatre from the continent, Udall created a new form 
a distinctly English comedy. And some scholars have attempted to draw a line from this to the comedy of Shakespeare and others a few decades later. The play can be summarised as follows. Ralph Royster Doyster is in love with Dame Christian Custance, her main attraction being her wealth. And to help advance his case with her, he enlists the help of Matthew Merrygreek. Ralph is foolish and vain. Matthew is parasitic and an artful sycophant. Custance is promised to Gawain Goodluck, a successful merchant, and rejects Ralph's advances. But her rejection is misreported to her intended by a servant, and her constancy is thrown into doubt. Ralph, much put out by the rejection of his advances, vows to march on Custance's house and take her by force. But he and his entourage are held at bay and humiliated by Custance's serving women, who beat them off with pots and pans and other kitchen utensils. With her virtue proven, the play ends happily and reconciliations are made all round and the marriage, as was always intended, takes place. All of which sounds very Roman comedy, but that is only true in the outline, the happy ending with the wedding and the traditional structure of the five-act play. It is in English and set in a contemporary landscape and time. The songs that are played throughout and the rhyming text are from the English folk tradition, and although the characters are stock and somewhat familiar, they include some variations that reflect their filtering through Commedia dell'arte and the English medieval traditions. To give you an idea of the language and the tone of the play, here is the prologue in updated English. What creature is in health, either young or old, but some mirth with modesty will be glad to use? As we in this interlude shall now unfold, wherein all scurrility we utterly refuse. Avoiding such mirth wherein is abuse, knowing nothing more commendable for a man's recreation than mirth which is used in an honest fashion. For mirth prolongeth life and causeth health. Mirth recreates our spirits and voideth pensiveness. Mirth increaseth amnity, not hindering our wealth. Mirth is to be used both for more and less, being mixed with virtue in decent comeliness. As we trust no good nature can gainsay the same, with mirth we intend to use, avoiding all blame. The wise poets long time heretofore under merry comedy's secrets did declare, wherein was contained very virtuous lore, with mysteries and forewarnings very rare. Such we write neither Plautus nor Terence did spare, which among the learned at this day bears the bell. These, with such others, therein did excel. Our comedy, our interlude, which we intend to play, is named Royster Doyster indeed, which against the vainglorious doth inveigh, whose humour the roistering sort constantly doth feed. Thus by your presence we intend to proceed in this our interlude by God's leave and grace, and here I take my leave for a certain space. The comedy continues in Gamma Girton's Needle, our next earliest play. The authorship of the play is not known for certain, but it was performed at Christ College, Cambridge in 1566, and two fellows were there at the time, William Stevenson and John Still, have been suggested as possible authors. The play was printed in 1575, with authorship credited to Mr S, Master of the Arts, hence the guesswork about its creator. John Still went on to become Bishop of Bath and Wells, one of England's more important bishoprics, and he doesn't sound like the likeliest person to have written a coarse farce that was subtitled A Right Pithy and Pleasant Comedy. But he was the only master at Cambridge at the time with the right initials, as far as could be discerned in the 18th century when his authorship was first ascribed. However, it seems likely that the manuscript was in the printer's hands for some time before it was published – thereby bringing William Stevenson into the frame. He also had a career in the church after his time at Cambridge, but he was not as high-flying as John Still. In the play Gamma, or Grandma Girton, is repairing a hole in the breeches of Hodge, the houseman. She manages to misplace her needle, and soon has the whole household looking for it. Dickon, a trouble-making local beggar, gets involved in the search and says he will summon the devil for advice in the matter. Hodge, still in his breeches full of holes, is terrified at the prospect and makes a quick exit as he loses control of his bowels. 
Dickon then tells Grandma Gerton that the devil told him that the solution was somewhere between cat, rat and chat. Grandma Gerton's neighbour is Dame Chat, whom Dickon now accuses of the theft of the needle. Dickon then further stirs things up with Dame Chat by telling her that Gamma Gerton thinks that she has taken her cook and eaten him. With the good dame, her servant Doll, the curate Dr Rat and others, the argument over the needle rages, sweeping backwards and forwards across the characters and the stage, leading to much physical comedy as accusations fly. The situation is resolved when Dr Rat, having been beaten up, calls on the bailiff, who exposes Dickon's lies. He is given a very lenient punishment and slaps the returned Hodge on the behind, whereupon he painfully realises that Gamma Gerton has left the needle stuck in the material covering his rear end. So clearly the comedy is in the caustic humour and the vulgarity of the characters, their often coarse language which is expressed through rhymed couplets and the physical slapstick comedy. In the five-act structure and the basics of the stock characters, there are echoes of Roman comedy here too. Whoever the author was, they knew their Plautus and Terence, but like Ralph Royster Doyster, the play has a very English tilt to it. This is a play that shows the English peasantry at their best or their worst, depending on your point of view. The loss of the needle may sound inconsequential to us, but the play serves to illustrate what a valuable possession a good needle was. The lost needle is Gamma Gerton's only needle and its loss is very significant to her and even if the students and the masters who saw the play were probably somewhat more wealthy or at least not as poor as the characters in the play they would have understood the import for the poor though there's a good chance that they were laughing at and not with the characters. Down the centuries we can still detect the vitality of the piece. Again, for a sense of the language and a little of that vitality, here's the opening of the prologue, which describes the plot and is spoken by Dickon. As Gamma Gerton, with many a wide stitch, sat piercing and patching of Hodge, her man's breech, by chance or misfortune, as she her gear tossed, in Hodge's leather breeches her needle was lost. When Dickon, the bedlam, had heard my report that good Gamma Gerton was robbed in this sort, He quietly persuaded with her in this street stroud, Dame Chat, her dear gossip, this needle had found. Yet knew she no more of this matter, alas, than knoweth Tom our clerk when the priest says the mass. Hereof there ensued so fearful a fray, Master Doctor was sent for, these gossips to stay, because he was a curate and esteemed full wise. A little later in the Tudor period, the history or chronicle play would be the mainstay at theatre, and we have one example of what could be considered a prototype for the latter, much more complex successes of Shakespeare and others, and it was written by someone we've met before. But thinking of this as a history play is really stretching a point. King John, written Johann, but I'm sticking with John, was written in 1536 by John Bale. And although it has historical characters and events, it is more morality play than a truly history play. You will remember that John Bale, as the ex-Carmelite monk and now supporter of and apologist for Protestantism, under the guidance and protection of Thomas Cromwell, and of course as translator of Pamachius, which was presented at Cambridge University and gave Bishop Gardner and the Vice-Chancellor some difficult moments with the Privy Council. The extant manuscript for King John was discovered in Ipswich in 1831 by John Payne Collier, that slightly dodgy scholar who found many old manuscripts and such valuable documents from the period as Henslow's diary. It now resides in the Huntingdon Library in California. The document contains two versions of the play in two different hands, one of which has been shown to be John Bales by comparison with other documents known to be by him. The two versions have, in a moment of scholarly inspiration, been labelled the A text and the B text. Careful study of the document has concluded that the first scribe copied the text from an unknown source and then added some small corrections, presumably as he reviewed his work. This version runs to about 44 pages. Then, sometime later, Bale himself took this text and corrected small items, spelling mistakes, the odd word replaced and the like. But then he also wrote some longer corrections and additions in the margins of the manuscript. 
On two occasions, he decided to add longer passages, and he wrote these out on smaller pieces of paper. He then used symbols in the original text to show where the new lines should be inserted. Towards the end of the revisions, he seems to have decided that a complete rewrite was needed, and using a combination of margin notes, new sheets and reusing sheets originally inserted by Scribe A, he made significant updates to the script. The primary thrust of these additions and changes is to make the character of Sedition a much more forthright and bold character than in the original play, but it makes for a very messy and complex manuscript to try and interpret. Perhaps seeing that this would be a problem for future players and readers, Bale then wrote out the later corrections and additions in an uninterrupted hand. So what we have as the final version of the play is therefore something that has been much updated since its first performance, to the extent that the original ending is completely lost, despite notes in the text that suggest that it was performed in its original form at least twice. The A-text section also indicates details of how the players were doubled up in parts, which suggests that this text was transcribed from a close association with an early performance, and possibly even from the prompt book. There are some references to the text to recent political events that suggest the earliest version of the play was performed in the mid-1530s. But these are in the later part of the rewritten text, so it could have been added later by Bale with some fortuitous hindsight. Bale was forced into exile after Cromwell's demise in 1540, but returned to England 12 years later, when he was appointed to a bishopric in Ireland. He attempted to sit Mary's reign out there, but was brave enough to have some plays produced, and these forced him into another period of exile. He returned to England in 1558, and was appointed a canon at Canterbury by Elizabeth. The later manuscript pages for King John where we see the rewritten ending are dated by watermark in the paper at 1558. Again, some allusions to recent events suggest that the last editions were made after September 1560. Bale died in 1563, so we can be sure that these additions to the play reflect Bale's latest thinking shortly before he died. It seems likely that it was a play that Bale came back to again and again, and the final epilogue may have been the last edition made in 1560. Elizabeth visited Ipswich in 1561 and the play was performed for her then, so presumably these latest editions were associated with finalising the play for that visit. So here is a summary of the play in that latest version that we have. England is a personified character on stage and she is complaining to King John that she has had her rights and wealth taken from her by the unholy clergy who have also driven her husband, God, from the realm. King John swears to put this right, but is mocked by the church's agent, Sedition. With his co-conspirators, dissimulation, usurped power and private wealth, he shows how the government of the land has been subverted through the church and the Pope. The king calls on nobility, clergy and civil order and asks for their support. Only clergy is reluctant, but when he explains the temporal power of kings to clergy, clergy agrees to join the others. But all three are soon drawn away from the king as sedition persuades them that the power of the Pope is stronger than any claim of the Gospels, which anyway can only be correctly interpreted by the Church. Left alone, King John calls on commonality, who he believes will be his strongest ally. But when he is led in by his mother, the king can see that commonality is weak and blind. His mother explains that he is weak because the church stole his belongings and blind because clergy has kept him in spiritual ignorance. Despite his weakened state, commonality reaffirms his willingness to serve the king, but this too proves short-lived as clergy soon proves what a strong hold he has over commonality. As King John stands alone to defend England, the Pope sends the historical figures Archbishop Stephen Langton and Cardinal Pandolphus to enforce his interdict, the placing of the whole country outside of the church, effectively excommunicating the whole population. Standing firm, the King presents arguments to show how church twists true faith to his own greedy ends and corrupts the virtues that should be within holy orders. 
The Pope threatens to invade England and the King has no choice but to submit his crown to the Pope and to rule England only as a vassal of the papacy. The King rules for a few years, but every time he tries to assert his authority, sedition and his cohort treason foil his plans. In an attempt to finally break the will of the King, sedition, working for the Pope, demands a dowry of one-third of the country's wealth for the bride of the dead King Richard. The plan falls apart just when it is about to succeed because the dead king's bride also dies. Undeterred, dissimulation, disguised as a monk, brings a poisoned cup to the king. He drinks, but not before he has forced the monk to do so also, and both die a painful death. Verity then appears and declares that any evils attributed to the king are the lies of monks. He lists the king's achievements from the common man and how they have been eroded by the church over the subsequent centuries. He declares that imperial majesty has arrived to save the widow England. Nobility, clergy and civil order are lectured by verity and as they see the error of their ways they swear eternal allegiance to imperial majesty and England is saved from the Pope and the evils of Rome. Bale's source for the play was John Tyndale's Obedience of a Christian Man, published in 1528. This was a treatise on the tyranny of the Pope, and like the play, saw in King John's fight against the power of the papacy a parallel with Henry's current position against the Pope. It's easy to see that Henry and Cromwell would both have appreciated the thrust of the argument. A large portion of the wealth of the country being passed directly to the Pope through the monasteries and the clergy was a significant driver of the early Reformation and in King John's reign. King John's argument for the supremacy of the sovereign and the idea that his actions had been maligned by the Pope and the Catholics generally over the intervening centuries both spoke to Henry's playbook. And I should not understate the rehabilitation of King John that these Protestant authors were attempting. In the late medieval world, he had become a much vilified figure, but was now being proposed as a Protestant saint, a king who gave his all for his country and for his people. As Tyndale deals with King John rather briefly in his work, and Bale was a scholar of English history, it's likely that he took elements for his play from elsewhere too, cherry-picking the historical events that best served his purpose. Perhaps what makes this play more interesting than just an example of a late morality play is the fusion of the morality play and the history play. Bale, for all his fierce belief in the new religion, was a scholar of the past and seems to have placed great store in the value of understanding England's history. He could have written a straight morality play. The evidence in the script is that he understood the form well and it's likely that he had acted and produced morality plays in his time. We have to remember that he was a scholar but had practical experience of the theatre too. He saw parallels with England's past and chose to create a morality play within the framework of a history play. It's true that he bends historical fact to fit his moral allegory, so it's clear which is the most important element to him. But I think it's interesting that he saw that fitting morality into historical events could make for a more powerful and meaningful theatrical experience. The mixing of history and allegory did create some problems for Bale, but he manages them well as he displays his skill as a playwright. For example, he has two main aims, to show how John's rule was undermined by the papacy and to draw a parallel between John and Henry. His problem was that he couldn't get away with showing Henry as being subject to temptation. That would be treason. So he follows the history as closely as he can, but portrays John as a king guided by scripture and the gospels in the mould of a modern Protestant king. The personified vices do not directly tempt the king, but trap him with the connivance of the Pope and his agents, all of which forces the king to his death and ultimate sacrifice in the name of his people. It's not exactly subtle, but it's a clever way to stay on the right side of the king's pleasure. For some, the final demise of King John turns the play into a prototype tragedy, but I find this a little fanciful, given the strong structure of the piece as a morality play. So here we have three plays that seem to give a very different view of the Tudor period in England. But simply to make a division between the hard-working peasantry enjoying a rustic comedy or two and the intellectual set seeking allegories to promote their heartfelt cause would be simplistic. 
The period was a time of seismic change in society and by Elizabeth's reign these changes and the penalties enforced around them were being felt from the top to the bottom of society. The theatre of the time reflects these changes. Ralph Royster Doyster and Gamma Gurton's Needle may be rustic comedy and are in no way the polemic of Bale's King John, but they are most likely written by educated men and performed by their students who were all concerned to one degree or another with the religious and social changes. In both of these comedies, and in Bale's use of historical events to draw current parallels, we have the beginnings of what was to become, within a few decades, some of English theatre's greatest achievements. Next time, we move on to the other type of theatre that is arguably the greatest achievement of the Elizabethan theatre, tragedy. We're still in the realms of schools and universities and in the company of two playwrights who wrote the earliest surviving Tudor edition to the canon, Gorbiduck, a tale with many elements that you will find familiar, as an ageing king divides his lands between his children and, surprise surprise, it leads to a few problems on a truly tragic scale. In the meantime, please join the Facebook group or page or find us on Instagram or Twitter to keep up to date with the podcast and other theatre-related stuff. If you'd like to help support the podcast, the easiest thing would be to pass on the word to anyone you think might be interested in a bit of theatre history or, if you have a moment, write a review and rate the podcast in your podcast app of choice. You can find details of other ways to support the podcast on the website at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. I look forward to your company next time, but if you do have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.